we have started the recording for the class. Um, last class, we looked at the prologue, uh, which is like an introduction to the rest of the Gospel of John. Uh, he touched upon, John touched upon some main themes, and um, those will be elaborated in the rest of the Gospel. Uh, so we, he, he, Jesus is introduced as uh, God. He is introduced as being equal with the Father. Uh, he is described as the light of the world. Um, and uh, there's also a hint at what is going to come because uh, John points out that even though Jesus has come as the light, the darkness does not like him. The world, or rather the people of the world, uh, are more happy with their own dark lives and they may not be open to him. So all these things are kind of implied uh, and hinted at in this uh, prologue. So now uh, from the prologue, we are moving into the actual um, beginning of Jesus' ministry. And even as Jesus' ministry begins, uh, it starts off with an introduction. Uh, it starts off with the testimony of John the Baptist, because it is John the Baptist who uh, introduces who, who Jesus is. He tells people this is who Jesus is. And um, uh, immediately after the introduction, uh, we see Jesus beginning his ministry. So um, in this Gospel of John, um, John chooses to uh, format you know, his writing in this particular way. If you see, all the four Gospel writers had their own way of presenting the facts, of arranging the facts in a particular order. And here we see that um, John, the writer of this gospel chooses to uh, start off by talking about um, before creation, when Jesus was already present, after talking about his divinity. Now he comes to uh, the ministry of this divine Jesus. And uh, John the Baptist gives an introduction and talks about who this divine Jesus is. And we will be seeing that now um, in the verses that follow. So uh, today, uh, we hope to complete John chapter 1, uh, verse 19 onwards, and up to the end of the chapter. And the aim, the goal is to finish chapter 2 as well. So um, we need to move uh, at, at this speed, uh, simply because we have around 36 sessions, and uh, we need to cover all of the you know uh, uh, chapters within this time period. So. Uh, Hopefully today, we will be able to complete both chapters 1 and 2. Now, um, John chapter 1 verse 19 up to chapter 2 verse 12 is where you have an introduction, the beginning of Jesus' ministry being described. And then um, after that, we have uh, one um, slightly uh, contradictory event taking place. And that's how chapter 2 closes. Uh, so we would, uh, you know, go into these details. Um, so, um, you know, if we could have uh, someone read out the verses, even as I just uh, request, uh, I would probably ask you to just read out maybe one verse or two verses at the most. And, um, uh, you know, even as we all follow in our Bibles, even as one person reads it out aloud, you know, let's just follow the uh, verses in, in our Bibles. And uh, then we will, you know, briefly discuss each of the Verses. So we'll go in this pattern. So we will begin now uh, with uh, John chapter 1, uh, verses 19 and 20. And uh, before we do that, uh, maybe we could just have a very brief word of prayer. So yeah, let's just start off with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much that uh, you have given these scriptures to us so that we can uh, study them and discover you in them and learn new things about you and be amazed and impressed by all that you are, and also find very practical um, uh, things that we can apply to our own lives, O oh Lord, and our ministries. So we pray, O oh Lord, that even as we uh, dig into your scriptures, we pray that your Holy Spirit would um, be with us, uh, uh, you know, stand by us, and, uh, and uh, open up these scriptures to us, O oh Lord. We cannot do this without your guidance and your leading. So we pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, accompany us 
uh, on this journey, even as we start uh, looking into your word and trying to find out uh, who you are and what you have in your heart for us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So uh, John chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. Uh, if we could have one person read out, please. Can I read, ma'am? Oh, yes, please. John, 9, John 1, 19 and 20. I'm using NIV. Now, sure. this was John's testimony. When the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. Amen. Okay. Amen. Over here, it says very frankly and openly, he, uh, John the Baptist did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. You know, there are some people who like to um, exalt themselves a bit uh, and uh, they try to present themselves as something uh, superior. But over here, John the Baptist has no such ambitions. Uh, he very plainly confesses and says, no, 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 you're thinking that I'm the Messiah, but no, I'm not the Messiah. Uh, I'm just the person who is pointing to the Messiah. And uh, so um, we see a man here who is very clear about what his purpose in life is. He has been created and he has been sent into this world to point people to the coming Messiah. And he has no aspirations for anything more, anything extra. And um, uh, so we see uh, that um, no other false ambitions mess up his life's purpose. And this is something that we need to keep in mind, you know, even as we try to fulfill God's purpose for our own lives. Um, we all have been placed here for, for different things that the Lord wishes to accomplish uh, through us. Uh, there is, of course, the things that we would be doing for the church, for the ministry, uh, to evangelize and reach out to the lost. But we also have been given uh, positions and responsibilities in, you know, in secular jobs and uh, in our family circles. And in all of these areas, there are things that God wants to accomplish. And if we are always rather busy in thinking about how can I promote myself, how can I exalt myself, we would probably miss out on God's purpose for us. So um, like this John the Baptist, who was very clear about who he is and what he has been placed here for, uh, we should be people who acknowledge the fact that we have been given certain responsibilities, uh, you know, whether it is towards our family circles or towards the, the people that we know uh, with, uh, with regard to people who do not yet know the Lord. We have a purpose. Uh, we have a goal that needs to be accomplished. And if we could just go about doing it, you know, instead of um, um, wasting our time and thinking of ways to promote ourselves, the Lord and his timing will promote us anyway. Because we see, right, in, uh, the, this, um, in the Gospels, Jesus speaks very highly of John the Baptist. John the Baptist himself never speaks anything much about himself. But Jesus speaks about him. So if we just go about sincerely doing our work and our bit, uh, the Lord uh, will exalt and promote us in his time, you know, in his own way. So we, it's, we do not need to uh, do that for ourselves. The Lord will do it for us. And so we see over here this attitude of John, uh, which is uh, very commendable. And uh, now if uh, maybe we can have someone read out uh, the 21st verse, please. John 1, 21. John 1, 21. Yes. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, he answered, No. Yes. So here we see that um, um, the people have begun to observe that here is a man who is very different from the people whom they have known before. Um, if we see, you know, uh, in, in, if we look into the uh, history of the Old Testament and the intertestamental period, we see that for 400 years, uh, there was silence in the sense uh, God was not speaking to the people. Uh, the Lord, uh, you know, says 
that you will be hungry for someone to speak to you and reveal to you uh, the mind of God, but uh, there would be silence uh, because the because of the people's attitude where they had they had no interest in the things of God. And so now, after this long silence, here is a man who is coming and speaking in a powerful way. And um, uh, because the Holy Spirit's anointing is upon him, the words which he is speaking is penetrating right into people's hearts. And they are beginning to uh, hear the voice of God and not just the voice of a man. And uh, so uh, John the Baptist is being used in this powerful way. So now the people start getting excited. So they think maybe this is the long promised Messiah whom we have been waiting for. Or maybe at least it is Elijah. You know, is the hope that they have. Um, now, why are they thinking that he may be Elijah? Because uh, in Malachi, there is a promise that first Elijah will come. He will prepare the way for the Messiah and then the Messiah would arrive. So um, they are thinking maybe he is the Messiah himself or maybe at least he is Elijah and he's preparing the way and very soon the Messiah would be coming. So the people are excited about this and uh, so they ask him this question. Um, maybe we could look at the reference, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Uh, that is where it talks about uh, Elijah coming once again. Uh, if, if, we, if we could have someone read out, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Could someone read out for us, please? Malachi chapter 4, uh, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and the dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So we see that um, John the Baptist seems to have been doing some kind of ministry where uh, he is restoring families, where he is restoring relationships, uh, uh, relationships between people and also the relationship with God because he even talks about repentance. So uh, he is preparing the hearts of the people so that when the Messiah comes and begins to speak his words, their hearts will no longer be hard but they would be willing to listen. Uh, they would be open to whatever the Messiah has to uh, teach. And so here we see that John the Baptist is doing a ministry of restoration uh, by teaching people about repentance and also in, uh, in teaching them to reconcile themselves uh, with one another. And uh, uh, so uh, we, uh, we observe these things about him in, this, uh, in, in, this particular, in these particular verses. Uh, now, uh, coming to the second part of uh, verse 21, where they ask, are you the prophet? Again, over here, um, they are uh, kind of thinking maybe it is the Messiah because Moses is the one who talks about someone named the prophet. And uh, the reference for that would be Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, verse 15, and also verses 18 and 19. So uh, it would be good if we can look at these verses. Uh, so if we could kindly look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, and also verses 18 and 19 in that chapter. Yes, Should I just... Deuteronomy 18, 18. 18 verse 15 the Lord, and also yeah the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers and you must listen to him and verse 18 and 19 okay I will yes. raise up from for, for them a prophet like you from among their brothers I'll put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him and I will hold accountable anyone who does not listen to my words that's 
the prophet speaks in my name. And so over uh, here, we have Moses. Not? Yes, right. Thank you. Uh, so we have Moses here saying that a prophet will be sent to you one day. And that prophet uh, will have God's words in his mouth. And because those words will be directly from God, if anyone does not listen to those words, then judgment would come upon them. So um, over here, they start thinking that maybe because John the Baptist's words are penetrating their hearts and having such an impact on them, they wonder maybe whether he is the prophet himself. And uh, so uh, John the Baptist clarifies and says, no, I am not the prophet. And over here, uh, um, uh, you know, he points rather to the true prophet who would be Jesus. Um, all right, uh, moving on a little bit, um, maybe we can look at John chapter 1, verse 29, because that is where he introduces Jesus. So if we could have one person read out John 1, 29. John 1 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward, toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right. So uh, you know, at first, he clarifies their doubts about who uh, about how he is not the Messiah. And now he is pointing towards the Messiah. And it's a very um, strange introduction that he gives regarding the Messiah. He doesn't say, behold, your king has arrived. He does not say uh, a savior has come you know, to deliver you from the bondage to the Romans. He does not talk about any of those things because in the minds of the people, they had been waiting and longing for this Messiah because they had been told by the prophets that when the Messiah comes, you know, he will reestablish the kingdom of Israel and he will, uh, they will once again be a great nation. And they are looking forward to that. They are eager for that. And uh, so they're mainly thinking about the Messiah in terms of liberation, you know, uh, uh, from uh, political bondage and economic bondage. And uh, here, John introduces the Messiah in a very different way. He says, look, this is the Lamb of God uh, who takes away the sin of the world. And um, they were familiar with this idea of Lamb. They knew that uh, the, by, that by sacrificing a lamb, uh, you know, you could seek forgiveness for your sins because that's what they did uh, on a very regular basis. The people would take a healthy, uh, you know, a, a well-fit lamb, take it to the temple, offer it over there as a sacrifice on the altar, and um, um, their sins would be transferred onto the lamb and God would grant them forgiveness. So this was something that they were very, very familiar with. And here, John is pointing to Jesus and he's saying that this is a lamb who's going to be sacrificed and uh, uh, his sacrifice will be for the, to take away the sins of the world. And uh, so th they would have found this, um, this kind of introduction very thought provoking. Now, um, today, when we think of the term lamb of God, you know, we are so used to hearing this term. Uh, we've kind of maybe become uh, desensitized to the meaning of it. Um, because what is uh, John saying over here when he says Lamb of God, what is he saying? You know, let's just imagine a man named um, named Josiah, let us say. Now, Josiah is taking his lamp to the temple, uh, you know, to place it on the altar and have it sacrificed. So that would be Josiah's lamp. And let us say another man named, um, I don't know, I can't seem to think of any biblical names. Let us say Berakaya. Okay, so Berakaya is now taking a lamb and going to the temple. So the lamb that he's holding in his hand, that would be Berakaya's lamb. All these people are taking their lambs and going to the temple to do what? To have it killed over there, you know? And uh, um, are they sentimentally attached to these lambs? Most probably not. Um, they have a good flock. And from the flock, they try to choose the best, you know, so that they can give God something that will honor him. And they just take it over there and it is killed. And they are glad that now, you know, their uh, sins have been covered. And that's the end of it. 
So you have Berakaya's lamb being taken, you have uh, Josiah's lamb being taken. And over here, God is also bringing a lamb. But this lamb is not just an animal. The lamb that God is bringing to the altar is his own son. And to understand the, the intensity of this, you know, we would have to maybe uh, think about the story of Abraham, because even over there, Abraham does not just take an animal. He's literally taking his son, his the son for whom he had prayed and waited for so many years. You know, for, for a greater part of his lifetime, he had waited. And uh, 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 that son, that much loved son, he takes him to the altar. And in the same way, we see over here the term lamb of God, you know, which we, we use it so lightly. But that is actually God carrying his lamb, not just an animal, but his own son voluntarily, willingly carrying his son to the altar, to the cross, to have him sacrificed. So um, uh, there's great power in this term when we think about it. God's lamb, God's son was being taken, uh, not just to be exalted, but first to be sacrificed. And we see the love of God in this term. Uh, and uh, so John says, that this is the Lamb of God. And he says that I am not worthy uh, to even, you know, um, uh, what, what's the term that he uses? Um, now, which verse would that be? Could someone, uh, you know, just point me to the verse where he says that he is not worthy to even, you know, uh, open his sandals? Okay, that would be verse 27. Yes. Um, yeah, if maybe one of us could read out John 1 verse 27, please. John 1.27. John 1 27. Yes. He is the one who comes after me. The straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Yes. Um, so uh, in those days uh, where you had uh, teachers, rabbis, and their followers, you know, their disciples. So the disciples would have to do all kinds of um, um, chores and, you know, all kinds of jobs for the rabbi. And um, the, the rabbi would teach them. He would, um, you know, allow them to stay with him. And it's basically these disciples who would go about doing all the um, odd jobs for their teacher. Uh, but one thing that the rabbi was not supposed to ask of his disciples is, you know, to unstrap his sandals. Because in those days, they didn't have paved roads like we do now. Uh, so they would be very dusty roads. And um, in fact, uh, the, 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 the sandals would in fact be in a rather... A bad condition, a rather dirty condition. So it was considered very low to ask someone to actually unstrap your sandals for you. So basically, a teacher would never, you know, even do that, uh, go to that extent of asking his disciples to do that. And here, uh, John says, even that lowly task, I'm not fit to do uh, for this, um, you know, for this Messiah, because he is uh, the very Lamb of God. Okay, so over here, um, uh, John is uh, talking about uh, how John the Baptist is talking about how great this person is that he's pointing out to the people. Okay, so um, so he says in uh, verse 31, uh, uh, the reason I came baptizing with, with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. So he says, I have been preparing all of you all these days to introduce him he is the messiah that um, you will need you will have to follow so um now coming to verse 34 john 134 if if someone could read out you know if you if you could just read out a little faster please so that we can you know yeah, catch up on, uh, on a little more matter yeah. john 134 uh pastor can i read yes please John 1 34 and I have seen and testified that this is the son of God okay so he says I have uh, seen 
uh, with my eyes something. And so the, the testimony which I am giving is something that I have seen with my own eyes. And then what does he say in verses 32 and 33? You know, we will not read out the entire uh, uh, verse. Uh, but then he talks about how what he has seen. He says that with his own eyes, he saw the Holy Spirit coming down upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And that was proof for him. That is how he was able to identify and know that this is indeed uh, the promised Messiah. And so he says, I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And so he says, therefore, I know that this is the Messiah. And therefore, I am pointing him out to all of you. And I'm testifying that he is God's chosen one. Okay, so um, in this first section, you have John. Uh, giving a clear testimony and an introduction saying that this is the person for whom I have been preparing all of you. Now onwards, you need to follow him. Now onwards, you must listen to his words and be willing to believe in him. And immediately in the next portion, which would be John chapter 1 verses 35 to 39, uh, you have John telling the same thing to his own disciples, his own followers. Uh, because John the Baptist by now probably had many followers, people who are eager to learn more about the Lord, people who are eager to repent of their sins and prepare themselves for this coming kingdom of the Messiah. So uh, two of these disciples are introduced to us over here in, uh, in this particular section, verses 35 to 39. And, um, you know, we had talked about this in our introductory class, uh, how one of them was Andrew. And the other, most likely, most scholars will agree that it was probably uh, John, the writer of this gospel. So the two uh, disciples of John the Baptist, Andrew and John the writer, these two persons, um, John speaks to them in verse 36. Okay, John 1, 36. And he says, look, the Lamb of God. So again, he gives the same introduction. He says, this is the... Uh, this is God's lamb. This is God's sacrifice is how he introduces Jesus. Um, and the response of the two disciples of John the Baptist is that now they are going to start following Jesus. They immediately respond and um, um, they choose to follow him. Uh, we have some uh, just, a, just a very interesting conversation over here. Uh, verses 38 and 39. Yeah, if maybe someone could read out John 1, 38 and 39. Uh, Ma'am, am I on? John 1, 38 and 39. Yeah. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. All right. Oh, yeah. We have uh, Charles Dix who has raised a hand. Uh, is there any question that you would like to ask? Go ahead, please. Yeah, you can unmute and uh, ask. It is not a question, but <clears throat> yeah. something that I was enjoying, the way Jesus, John was introducing himself and telling the people the way he was knowing Jesus. Like in verse 31, mm. he says, I myself did not know him, but mm -hmm. the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. That is so, so astounding, so big. Even in the verse that this is the one I meant when I said, the man who comes after me has mm. surpassed me because he was before me. Showing the people that really Jesus was before John, he has mm. been even before Abraham. So. It is so astounding, it is so important 
to, to see the, the, the testimony that the John is giving to the people and even giving reasons, like the reason as to why he is baptizing is mm. not for his own, but for the one who is coming after him to be revealed to Israel. That yes. was my take. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Um, now, John the Baptist would have known Jesus, you know, um, all his life, because after all, uh, John the Baptist's mother and uh, Mary, you know, were very close relatives. I mean, simply because when uh, Mary gets to know that uh, Elizabeth is carrying, she he she immediately goes to her. So they must have been close relatives. So uh, these uh, two uh, boys would have uh, you know grown up uh, knowing each other quite well. But John the Baptist does not treat Jesus lightly. He understands who he is through through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, and he treats him with the respect and the reverence that is due to the Messiah. So even though he, he they are they're just close relatives who probably would have known each other and rubbed shoulders on a day-to-day -day basis, um, uh, John addresses him with respect and he says, he was before me. So yes, we see that very beautiful truth coming out over here. Um, all right, yeah, just coming back to I know what we were uh, talking about, verses 38 and 39. Um, yeah, in verses 38 and 39, Jesus says to them, uh, what do you want? Okay. And uh, this is their response. They say, um, um, you know, where are you staying is what they ask. And then Jesus says, you know, come, come and see. And then it says in the last part of verse 39, they went and saw where he was staying and they spent that day with him. You know, they have just been introduced uh, um, uh, by John the Baptist and told that this is the Messiah. Uh, the Messiah is someone whom they have been waiting for since centuries, someone so powerful and great. And when this Messiah asks them, what do you want? They could have asked for any number of things, but it's so beautiful. All that they ask over here, you know, they say, where are you staying? Their longing is to be with him, to listen to his words, to learn from him and not so much for any kind of material blessings. Uh, because generally, I mean, if any um, world-renowned preacher, you know, were to come into you know our uh, church or something, we would probably ask for all kinds of things. You know, we would say, you know, pray that this miracle will happen for me or that. But here, we see these people not even asking about any such thing. Their main desire is to be with Jesus and to learn from Him because they have that hunger in their hearts, uh, and we see that uh, over here. Uh, all right. Uh, what else can we focus on? Um, so we have um, Andrew uh, who goes to his brother and tells him about Jesus. After spending that one entire day with Jesus, uh, probably the words which Jesus spoke uh, would have uh, inspired great uh, joy in their hearts. And so now he wants to go and share that good news uh, with his brother. So Andrew goes to um, uh, to Peter and he shares with him uh, and it says in verse yeah in verse 41 he announces with great excitement and says we have found the Messiah you know we have found the anointed one the one who has been promised and um, the next two verses 43 and 44 talk about uh, Philip also making a commitment to follow Jesus. Um, and then, of course, in verses 45 uh, to 51, we have the story of Nathaniel's encounter with Jesus. So uh, in this introduction to the ministry of Jesus, we see uh, how the first followers, the first disciples are getting gathered uh, because they are going to be the team uh, with which Jesus is going to work, you know, over the next uh, three years. So we have Nathaniel being mentioned here, and uh, um, maybe we can, uh, you know, look a little bit at this passage. Uh, if we could just read out verses uh, forty-five up to um, maybe forty-nine, yeah. 
45 to 49, if we could read, please. Forty-five to forty-nine, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, You have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Up to 49? Yes. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Okay, so uh, it's interesting. I mean, the different kinds of people, you know, whom uh, Jesus calls. Uh, so over here we have Nathaniel, who is very, uh, seems to be a very frank and very outspoken person. And um, he knows that, you know, this is not a very, um, um, very great place, you know, so... Um, Nazareth, he knows it's just a little town. And uh, he openly says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And so when uh, he approaches Jesus, these are Jesus' words. Jesus says, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He will frankly, openly say the facts. You know, so uh, Jesus says that about him. And uh, then Nathaniel asks, how do you know? And of course, the Lord reveals, Jesus reveals that he knew that earlier in the day, um, uh, Nathaniel had been sitting under a fig tree and um, scholars say that probably he was meditating upon the word of God when he was sitting over there and they say that he probably was meditating on the passage uh, which is in Genesis chapter 28 where it talks about you know Jacob's ladder and the angels ascending and descending and uh, they say that because we see uh, Jesus referring to that in verses 50 and 51. So uh, the basic scenario which uh, the scholars draw for us is that um, Nathaniel was probably sitting under the fig tree earlier on in the day and meditating on the word of God and probably to, you know, um, focusing on this particular chapter and thinking about how there's a ladder which connects heaven and earth and he, maybe he was thinking how wonderful it would be if he could find that. And, you know, if he could uh, 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 know God in that personal way, where there would be a ladder which can link him to God, where he can know more of, the, of, of God. And uh, probably, I know, meditating upon all of these things, uh, as he's going through the day, he is called by Philip, invited by Philip to come and meet with Jesus. And over here, Jesus speaks these words to him. Uh, which would be in verses 50 and 51. And uh, uh, Jesus says, very truly, I tell you in verse 51, he says, I, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So over here, um, Jesus is kind of making a reference to that uh, Genesis passage. And uh, uh, Jesus is saying in the same way that ladder linked heaven and earth. Now, Jesus himself is going to be that ladder which will link heaven and earth, a direct link where people will be able to now communicate with the Father because of Jesus. Through Jesus, they will be able to uh, do that. And uh, so they say that probably Jesus was touching upon a Bible passage which um, Nathaniel had been meditating upon earlier on in the day. All right. Um, and um, then uh, we have this term over here where Jesus is calling himself the son of man. And um, this you might have, you know, heard about in sermons. What is the significance of this term son of man? In many places, Jesus likes to refer to himself as son of man uh, rather than as, uh, um, as a king, you know, uh, because this term, it's directly a reference to the Messiah. 
So uh, we see that in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where we learn that this term son of man literally was used for the coming Messiah. If we could have one person, please, reading out Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel 7, 13 yes. and 14. Yes. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with a cloud of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign, sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. In this, uh, in these, uh, you know, two verses, the son of man is described in a very powerful way. It talks about how he has been given uh, authority, glory and sovereign power. It talks about how all the nations and all the peoples will worship him. It talks about how his dominion will be an everlasting dominion. So over here, wherever, whenever Jesus you know, refers to himself as son of man, he's not uh, talking about something low, something humble. He's in fact talking about uh, something very high. And he's declaring the one that Daniel spoke about, that is none other than me. You know, So the Lord is saying, that I am the son of man, the one who will have dominion and authority over all nations and all peoples. Um, and so over here, we have Jesus directly connecting himself, linking himself to that prophecy, which Daniel had talked about, how in the end times, uh, you know, um, when, the, when, the, when the time is right, the, uh, the son of man would come down and he would claim his authority. So uh, we see that uh, in this introductory passage, uh, the first four disciples uh, are gathered to Jesus' flock. Um, Andrew, uh, of course, Andrew and um, uh, John um, get to know Jesus through the di direction of John the Baptist. Uh, Peter, on the other hand, he hears about it from his brother. Philip, on the other hand, is directly called by Jesus himself. Jesus comes to him and says, follow me. And without any, um, you know, uh, without, a, without any expectations or demands, uh, Philip chooses to follow Jesus. And Nathaniel, of course, he is able to believe because he has an encounter where God reveals something to him, which, uh, he would, which um, Jesus would not have known unless he is God. So because of that encounter, Nathaniel is able to place his trust in him. So there are different ways in which people come to Jesus. Uh, uh, but ultimately, the point is that uh, they must be willing to believe. God gives everyone a chance. And at that time, when they are given that opportunity, are they willing to place their trust in him? Are they willing to be open in their heart and uh, receive him? That would be the main uh, point. Now, um, all right, it's 9.45, so we probably have about five minutes you know, before we take a break. Uh, are there any questions that you would like to ask? You can just unmute and ask because you know, I can hear you. So. Or anything that you would just like to you know, um, comment on, something that you liked, anything. No? Okay. Um, you know, before we go for the break, uh, four ways that Jesus gets identified over here in this introductory passage. Of course, he's called as God's lamb, you know, God's sacrifice. And he is also referred to as the Messiah because that's what Andrew calls him. He says, we have found the Messiah, the one who has been promised, the one whom we have been waiting for, for generations. We have now found him. Okay, so... He is directly referred to as the Messiah, the anointed one that whom the people have been waiting for. And uh, uh, Philip, 
when he talks to Nathaniel about Jesus, he says, this is the one that the Old Testament prophets had been prophesying about, is what he says. And uh, Nathaniel, after he hears Jesus telling about something which had happened earlier on in the day, he says, this is the son of God and the king of Israel. Okay, so uh, we have all these different titles being given to Jesus over here. Uh, so the identity of Jesus is being uh, elaborated upon. Okay, we, we uh, more and uh, more details are being provided about who this Jesus is. So, um, so in this uh, in the in this first chapter, uh, John the writer is creating a picture for his writers of who exactly Jesus is, the different aspects of of his uh, you know of his godhood. So these things are all brought brought out in the uh, first chapter. Now we would move into second chapter, and in chapter two we see uh, two incidents, and they don't they there does not seem to be any connection between the two, but for some very specific reason the Holy Spirit inspired John to put down these two incidents together. One of course is the uh, water being turned into wine at a wedding, and the other incident is the cleansing of the temple. So we will look at that. Um, so maybe we could come back and rejoin at 10 o'clock. All right. So uh, we'll just go for a break now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 